cyber security. You know, cyber security is such a, a big name. It often starts with attacks, right? It starts with attacks and then we defend. So most often new attacks are discovered and then we look for defense. You know that your house will probably, there'll be a theft on your house, so you put a lock. You'll never put a lock if you don't know there is a, a theft on your house. So that's how the cybersecurity world uh, is always is. Right now in many conferences like RSA, Black Hat, the, one of the two topics, hot topics is AI and uh, supply chain security. Okay, so it's, it's an important topic. So I want to start my presentation as well um, with a story. Okay, it's a, it's a nice crime story I want to start with. Um, imagine there is a, and that's what I said, it's all about attack and then defense, right? So uh, why did I choose like this is because I would really want to teach uh, software supply chain security as a definition to people. And I thought this is the best way. So imagine there is a, um, an attacker like Alice who wants to kill a very high profile person like Bob. Bob is a very secure person. Uh, and Alice cannot uh, directly kill the person because Bob has so much security. Even if Bob walks in, in the morning walk, it's impossible to leave. And today's our networks, our infrastructure has become more and more secure. It's really hard to directly attack. So there has to be a change in strategy to attack uh, systems, to attack people now, is uh, the supply chain. That means if Alice wants to kill Bob, uh, she has to find, uh, for example, a grocery store where Bob's always purchases something, like an apples, for example. Bob wants to buy apples from a nearby grocery store. So Alice understood with some uh, open source intelligence like OSINT, she understood Bob is going to buy something from the grocery store. So Alice has to walk to a uh, grocery store, make some social engineering with the guy in the grocery store, put some poison or something in the apples, and then make sure the apples are going to Bob's house. Obviously, the apples will go to many other houses as well, beyond Bob's house, but the point is to kill Bob, right? Or the other way is if I can't convince the grocery store guy through social engineering, I have to go a little bit beyond the supplier and see who is the farmer who makes the apples at the first place. Does it make sense? So um, I have to try another method and, and that's the, the whole point here is the whole evolution of cyber attacks, they have changed from attacking the networks, live networks, live systems, live applications which are running into the supply chain of all of these. So the moment um, you have an idea that you want to develop a software, you want to uh, build your laptop and you want to sell your laptops to somebody. Imagine somebody put a bug in the supply chain and sold you the laptop, Dell or Apple, or nobody has no idea, but somebody in the supply chain has corrupted that. So supply chain is more easier now attacking for attackers. So that's why this has become a more problem that they can attack supply chain of everything. Everything you can imagine, hardware to network to host to the applications, everything. So this, uh, this is the key point that either I can uh, look for suppliers or I can look for the supplier of the supplier, okay? There are so many uh, suppliers for every uh, software that we build. I mean, we don't develop 100% in-house. No software is made 100% in-house, right? So there's a lot of components that software developers download and use from the internet. There are so many vendors we, we outsource our software to develop. So a lot of these things that you see like uh, attackers are targeting like data service, library, binary code, everything that you can think of can be attacked. Um, so why exactly are we talking about supply chain security? I told you uh, conferences like RSA and all of these things are, are really talking about supply chain, but just as some metrics, I don't want to go deep into this, but some metrics in the past few years, in the past few years, uh, significant amount of customers have been impacted. Significant amount. And that's a survey done by one of these companies here. The number of packages, packages is all those third party components which developers use, a lot of components that got impacted. And this is a report from a company called Sonatype in 2023 May. They just released uh, this. There's been huge uh, shift in the supply chain attacks just this month, just this month in May. And if you see uh, every month, 1.2 billion vulnerable components are being downloaded globally. And Sonatype is a company that offers products like Nexus Lifecycle, Nexus Repository. So they know that these companies, even the Maven Repository, by the way, if you are a Java guy, is owned by Sonatype. So. They know that there are so many vulnerable components in these that have been downloaded globally everywhere in the world. And sometimes developers don't see that they're uh, like, just like for example of Office uh, 2016, 
you know, we don't often download from Microsoft website. We just go to any fake website where I find a professional Office 2016 and I just download it. We don't know if somebody has put something in between. We have no idea. Same way developers download the same log4j from various sources. They have no idea if this, if this really came from Apache or is it from another source? Somebody have altered it. They don't know. So lots of attacks that recently happened. I'm really talking about uh, the situations that got attacked. I don't want to go into details of these attacks because it's for them to handle it. It's not for us. But just understand that this really happened to many, many companies. They are just some of those that are really popular in this situations right now. Uh, this is according to the ENISA, the European government, who published this information. Some of those suppliers who got at attacked, a lot of companies, big companies, use these suppliers. So this is a straight information from the European government. Uh, lots of suppliers that 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 impacted not just the regional ones but the global as well. So some of the groups like APT29, the Advanced Persistent Threat 29, which I've got this like, one of the Russian group. Uh, probably not named them, but. Uh, yeah, they have been uh, targeting all those suppliers. So it's big. It's big. So one one key uh, definition I want to uh, to highlight to those probably some beginners. It's a very di uh, distinct difference between vulnerable and malicious. Most often people get confused between these two. There could be a vulnerability in your system. Like for example, a developer is logging a password in clear text in the log files. Okay, it's a vulnerability. So we assume that somebody will see the password and misuse it. But malicious is something it's different where an attacker has intentionally put a bad code into the package that is like, for example, deleting your C drive. That is functionality that they have added and it's not vulnerable. A malicious code need not be vulnerable. That's a very key point. If you run your SaaS tools and if you run your uh, uh, any other SEA tools, you'll never discover these malicious code because there is no standard for this in the market. For a vulnerability, you can say there is CDSS. Okay, I can understand all this. But as as Maven repository owners, Sonatype or Black Duck guys or any repositories like JFrog, which they hold this, if they find that there is a bad guy who put a malicious code to delete your C drive, how can they communicate this to you? There is no standard in the industry right now. As of now, this this is a big problem. Uh, malicious code is intentionally designed functionality to do bad things. It's a proper code written into the library. And most often our developers just use the libraries as they get, and then they use it. So that is one problem that I want to highlight with an example here. So how to address the malicious code problem in the, in the industry? So companies like Checkmarks, SNCC, or Sonatype, these are real commercial companies. So what they do is they created their own database. They are going into every open source world uh, software packages that they find on the internet. And they are seeing if there is any malicious code in them. And they are making an identity that in their database, that hey, please don't use log4j 2.4.1 because it contains malicious code of deleting your C drive. So they make an identity. So this is an example of the same package, NPM RC package, which was found to be malicious. Four different companies created four different IDs, but pointing out to the same problem. Now, if you are using their product, like if you are using uh, check marks or Sona type, probably you are informed. But if you are using open source products, you have absolutely no idea because in open source, it's all about contribution. If contribution exists, open source products evolve. But commercial companies are putting effort to find malicious components. This is growing. That is the biggest point of supply chain attacks today. That malicious components are growing beyond vulnerabilities. But if you use tools like OWASP dependency check or track, I guess some of you are familiar with these tools, they find vulnerabilities. They'll never be able to tell you if a component is malicious or not. They have absolutely no idea. Because again, it depends on contributions, right? So they might evolve with time. But today, lack of standard has made everybody create uh, a same uh, component being reported multiple times. Uh, attacks, when I talk about su uh, supply chain, so what is the supply chain for a software? So the so it starts from the source code that developers write. Uh, there could be attacks on the source code. Like for example, the moment you are developing the source code, uh, the source code in your Git repositories or Mercurial or whatever source control systems that people use, they can alter it. Like uh, I have given some of the example of attacks, but that's huge. A huge number of attacks are possible here on various programming languages. Or the attacks can be on the source control system like uh, the Git control system or Mercurial, the control, source control system, which is different. 
For example, attacks like repo jacking and brand jacking. Some of you have heard, I guess the other guys are also talking about those. And then we also have the attacks on the package managers. So some, some teams assume that I'm using an internal source of Nexus repository or JFrog repository, and I'm downloading from the internal repository, so I'm safe. So this is a big uh, assumption. If you truly dig into the repositories, the way they work, they are proxies. So if you find log4j component from your local repository, if the uh, repository doesn't find it, it goes to the internet and then, and then gives it back to you. These are only proxies. Just because you have a repository in your local system company, that doesn't mean you're secure by any means. All these uh, repositories are just going into the internet and downloading, so you have all these problems. For one example is dependency confusion that I want to highlight because many attacks are there, but uh, imagine if one of us is making an internal component, which never existed in the internet. It's a library that I'm creating, like an encryption library. And I gave this to my dev development teams. So I created this uh, jar file or a DLF. I put it on my repository. Now all my company employees are able to whoever is using encryption, they use my library. And I created library 1.0. But in the internet, somebody understood that, hey, uh, this company guys are creating an encryption 1.0. So they will create an encryption 10.0 and they will post it on Maven repository. Now your repository like Nexus or JFrog sitting in your company will see that, hey, I found a 10.0 in the internet, but these guys are asking me like 1.0, how about I take 10.0 and give to this guy? But that was a malicious one in the internet. So dependency confusion happens like which one should I give the internal one or the external one? But I found the latest one on the internet and that, that gives the, the most vulnerable one for you. So these are a lot of attacks that are being attempted. They understand that's your internal one. So they put a, a latest version on the internet and then people start downloading those. Uh, repo jacking, brand jacking, the name the names will tell you. But yeah, that's another thing. On the CI CD systems as well. So it's not just about source code. It's not about source control system. It's not about package managers as well. It's also on the CI/CD systems like Jenkins, GitLab. You have seen the Jenkins version. I don't know. Uh, some of you might use Jenkins. And when was the last time you updated Jenkins to the latest one? <laughs> Most often we'll say probably a few years. Uh, when was the last time you have seen uh, so many plugins? You know, the architecture of Jenkins says uh, you can download plugins from any source, right? You can download. Anybody can develop a, a, a plugin for Jenkins. The, there could be malicious plugins. There could be malicious components in Jenkins. There could be malicious um, pipelines. There could be malicious applications. So a lot of things uh, that are a problem on the CI/CD systems. You can use Jenkins, but you may not be CI/CD. You are still vulnerable. Okay. And then we have the uh, container supply chain and the orchestration supply chain. You know, base images. A lot of people use base images or. Uh, from the internet, right? They just see, can I find an Ubuntu base image? Can I find a Docker, a lot of Docker base images, just people that download and use it uh, from every source uh, that they want. So these base images are also having malicious uh, base images. You don't know the author of the guy. There is no one way to, to measure whether the authenticity of these uh, messages, I mean, these images. So there are insecure registries, uh, registries and repositories, and then you have the malicious images and the Orchestration as well, even the Kubernetes Helm charts that being attempted. And then you have the cloud supply chain, which is another uh, attack vector where you are going to the cloud, the, these parts. So supply chain, again, this is not comprehensive by any means, but it is just to tell you that attacker has so much attack surface here. So it's more easier to, uh, like I said in the example of the Apple and the Bob, it's more easier to go and find a supplier who is supplying stuff for you to attack them rather than attacking you because you're growing on security day by day. So things are changing now. So these, you see the same techniques that you see the social engineering inside of threat. These are the real attacks being attempted, but uh, the compromise is really happening on the supplier side. Okay. And then we have the vendor supply chain. We even outsource it. So, and you, for all these cases, you might have your own supply chain mechanisms, your supply chain processes. Everybody is different, right? Not everyone is the same in terms of the supply chain. Your supply chain could be different from my supply chain. So, but the point is these supply chains have been the target. Um, even when we outsource some of our uh, development or uh, software building to the different companies, these companies are attacked and that's what you saw in the European report. Uh, so many uh, supply chains being attacked. This is one another scenario. I I did a little bit of research on these topics because I'm not here. 
and then I came up with some standard frameworks that I wanted to really highlight here. Some of the standards, uh, references, what you can talk about. Open SSF, obviously, when you talk about supply chain security, nobody can exclude Open SSF. Great work. Many people are contributing to Open SSF. A big job. Um, it's something that you have to look at their scorecard, their uh, SLSA, for example. The SLSA is from OpenSSF, but it's an amazing framework uh, to apply in, in, in levels. If you And why we should apply this is because for you to progress. So everybody starts at different level, and then they need a way to identify how do I progress, what is my improvement level. So SLSA and the Microsoft S2C2F framework, which I will dig a little bit later on, is SLSA is more from the provider side. That means if you're a software development team, you're going through the source code, build, deploy, and all of this, which you are a producer. And then you're like a consumer, like Office 2016, I just download, I use it, I'm a user. I'm, a, I'm just a consumer of the software. So on the consumer side, there are eight different categories. The s 2 c 2 from Microsoft was just uh, unveiled at the RSA this year. So it's an interesting framework, which we tried and we found it really useful. It also got four levels of uh, Using. So sometimes we don't develop software, sometimes we use the software that somebody developed. We still have the supply chain problem even when you use the software. So that's about S2C2F. We also have the OWASP ones, uh, software component verification standard. There is no perfect way to evaluate whether an encryption library developed by WIS in the internet is good or not. There's no way because we don't even know, okay, maybe the guy has a millions of downloads that is happening that doesn't still claim to be a security free or anything. So anybody can be um, uh, having malicious components, but OWASP has really helped us a little bit reference there. And the Google's, uh, Google's one is an interesting one. Google started digging into every open source in the market and said, let us handle this problem. You know, it's not easy. So let's go and check every damn software that's available on the internet, whether they are malicious, whether they are vulnerable. So they created something called trusted OSS. But unfortunately, this is available only if you're a GCP user. So if you're not GCP, you're not using this right now. I hope they will make it more public. Right? And it's supported on Java and Python languages only. I mean, they can't cover every language, right? So much billions and billions of components exist in this world that they themselves uh, uh, cannot so easily solve it. And the list framework. But uh, uh, just a quick slide. I don't want to go deep into this part, the SLSA and the S2C2. Uh, S2C2 yeah. um, we are doing good on the time. Um, SLSA, uh, the one that I pointed out, the difference between the two, talks about source threats, the build threats, the dependency threats, and all of this. Obviously, uh, you have a, a threat there. It's an important point with supply chain security taught us that our development system must be as secure as production systems. We know this before, but we never took it seriously. At least, I've never seen in 20 years that a dev system is as secure as a production system. But right now, now is the time in supply chain where your build systems, your development systems like an IDE, like Eclipse or uh, Visual Studio, VS Code, whatever you're using, that system must be as secure as a production system. Because if you try to download every plugin that you find on VS Code, every plugin on Eclipse, they create a, a supply chain problem for your developers. And supply chain is something that you cannot pen test. I mean, I can't go to every developer PC and start pen testing whether their Eclipse environment or VS Code is really secure, right? Pen testing in supply chain is a big challenge. It's not really practical to go to every dev PC and start pen testing. So the biggest thing we can do is only awareness. So go and tell, talk to your developers and say, not to download everything that they find an untrusted source, make a policy, make, make sure you have enough practices in the company to protect it against them, right? And S2C2F also again talks about the layered approach that you see, but uh, sorry, so I don't want to dig into that. So the big question that people always ask me is, okay, uh, you, I give you an example of a dependency confusion. So we developed version 1.0 in the company, and then there is a 10.0 in the internet, right? So if I use the most latest version, I have a problem with supply chain. If I use the least version, I have the problem with vulnerability. There are too many vulnerabilities on the lower versions. So which, which version should I really use as a developer? They're confused. If I have to use log4j for logging in my application, should I use the too old version? Then too many vulnerabilities. If I use the two latest version, then there is a supply chain risk for me. So what exactly I have to do? So this is where the concept of dependency pinning will come. Dependency pinning is exactly means do not use the word latest. Do not use the word latest. Either it is containers, either it is libraries in your form file of Java or anything. 
do not ever use the word latest and by default build your systems if you use the word latest you are getting yourself vulnerable to all the malicious components that are getting added on the internet pinpoint your uh, versions to the specific ones that you have tested you found it to be good and then make sure that version is being used if you want to upgrade to the newer version go through a thorough testing environment of that component there is no enough run through the malware tools like uh, antivirus tools that you have clam av make a that you think these components are really good enough from malicious component they're not doing any bad stuff for us then you slowly migrate to the newer version but I, today for example in docker hub hub.docker.com i find so many so many docker files the source code being written with the word latest they just write uh, the latest docker file that they are automatically downloading the newer versions of every container that is released you are just making yourself vulnerable to the uh, supply chain attacks if you know that okay and then the concept of bill of materials so as boom so everybody talks about bill of materials and what what exactly is this so some people get confused that why should i do as boom and all of this stuff so fundamentally my first question so if you want to go to a grocery store and you want to buy stuff what exactly do you do do you look at the front page or do you look at the back page that talks about ingredients of that so that is where my point is coming that you should never buy a software or a component just because it's from a branded reputed source or anything no that's not the point if you look at the ingredients or the nutrition facts you really understand what they are doing it's not about the brand it's about the nutrition facts and this is the one so imagine if nutrition facts or the ingredients never was a law that they never put this information on the product you're just assuming you have no idea what's in the product you're just taking it but if i put this transparently and i told you there is sugar in it at least you are accepting the risk that oh there is 50 grams of sugar i still can eat it i like it i'm accepting the risk but i know that there is so much sugar in it same way in the software that is exactly what we are trying to introduce through sbom in software bill of materials they, we need transparency we don't want your exe files without the sbom if you don't tell me what is in your exe what is in your jar files what is in your dlls all the list of components that you use to develop I'm blinded. I don't even know what's inside the software. Do you expect me to reverse engineer and understand? No, I want transparency, right? This is where the world is moving. People need transparency on both producer side and the consumer side. And they said, please generate an SBOM file. Tell me what your software contains. And then there are two standards when you want to exchange this information, Cyclone DX and SPDX. Cyclone DX was originally designed for supply chain security, which means it will contain the CVE. It will tell you, I'm using log4j, which has CVSS 3.5. Now a customer will see, oh, you're delivering a software or a Docker container, which has this SBOM, which tells me you're using log4j, which has CVSS 3.1. I'm okay to take this because it is low CVSS. Or if it is high CVSS, I will do something to protect myself on my side. At least it's transparent. But imagine if I don't deliver an SBOM file, I'm, I'm not able to communicate properly to the customers. And I don't know sometimes, who is using my component in the internet, which is the case with GitHub today. People download libraries. The, the author of that library has no idea who in the world is using this component, right? But if the author is generating an SBOM and producing it, it's for better. SPDX is a, a standard that was designed for uh, licensing information. So to share licenses and copyright. Today, as of we speak, these two standards are different. They're not the same, but there is an intent to merge, as I spoke with one of the architect here. But right now, if you're talking about supply chain, you have to deliver a, a Cyclone DX format. Okay. This is an interesting image. I found one, one of the guys who created this saying a nutrition fact based as well. Uh, so tools to generate, I've given lots of references in case if you're not aware. Uh, we have on all these languages, there is a hyperlink there. You can refer to all those uh, hyperlinks tools like how exactly do I generate a Cyclone DX based SBOM file in my language. But for SPDX, you have two tools that I really recommend. Uh, there are other tools in the market which I didn't really like it. Functionally, they were not good. But the Microsoft SBOM tool and the Kubernetes 6 tool was good to generate an SPDX. Of course, you need to digitally sign everything. My recommendation of digitally signing is to go with 6 store cosign. Again, it is from the OpenSSF. Uh, I've personally tried it from over two years right now. It's a great tool. It can sign every, every file that you can imagine. Star dot star. It can sign every file, every container, Everything that you can imagine, uh, six store uh, cosine really works well. It works with any PKI you can imagine. If you want to have your own certificate to sign a particular artifact, a zip file, everything, it works great for that. 
Uh, and then some best practices. Okay, I spoke about a lot of these. I hope you are doing well all the time. Okay, some best practices of defense. Uh, firstly, I don't know where you are, so I wanted to start with fundamental thing. Software supply chain security, like I said, it talks about source code to build platforms to source control systems to everything. You need to have a proper uh, application security framework being used in your company, and most of these frameworks, like ISO 27034 or the Basin uh, or the NIST framework or OWASP SAM, they are talk they are talking about having a proper practices in place for supply chain as well. Uh, your CI/CD systems are secure. Your source code is secure. Running SaaS tools, DAS tools, everything threat modeling, uh, lots of this stuff. So this is a fundamental thing to have in any company. If you are not having this, this is the first thing to do. But if you already have this, a little bit of uh, more defense. So that is the first point. Secure your CI/CD systems the same way as your production. So this is one point that I mentioned, where it's not just about Jenkins server. It's not just about the Jenkins plugins, Jenkins project configuration. Sometimes every project on Jenkins is also vulnerable. The credentials that you store, the environment variables that you store, these are all exploited. The keys are exploited. So many things are happening on the Jenkins project, Jenkins application, Jenkins pipeline. And there is a reference, by the way, OWASP has recently released something called OWASP Top 10 CI-CD Security Risk. Very interesting one. It has been given by a company to, as a dedicated to OWASP, and it's a very good reference. You should look at that. And then secure your development environments. I mean, you have to harden your environment. I can, like I said, pen testing is not a solution. Uh, you have to inform your developers to make sure they harden their IDE environments, its plugins, source control systems, the merge request. So every time there is a code merge request that happens, you need to ensure it's properly reviewed in place. Okay, don't make sure that all the developers can put, push code to the main branch and then they can release to production straight away. That's not the point. If you have branched out your version control and you have a specific changes being done, you need to go through a review to be push uh, merging to the main branch. So lots of these things, even for pull requests, everything has to be reviewed. Why somebody is cloning your code? Why? Because there's a local copy, there is a remote copy of the source code. Integrity of this is really important, right, in supply chain. Signed commits and tags. Cosign will also help you on the uh, on the signed commits, especially for Git. You can use your own PKI and you can sign every developer commits. If you're a developer, you understand what I'm saying here. Every commit that you do, Git commits or uh, the tags, everything can be signed on their name. Today, the way Git architecture works is I can put my colleague's name, colleague's email ID on my code, and I can push the code on his name. It works. That's how the Git architecture is. When I clone the code onto my local copy, I can put anybody's name. And the server will just uh, show that that guy has checked it. I can totally remove my name. There is no authentication for pushing the code. That's how the Git architecture. That's why sign commit and sign tax are really important for that reason. Ensuring uh, for integrity. Uh, then we have the secrets. So secrets is every sensitive data that you can imagine, passwords, crypto keys, uh, files, everything, everything uh, that you can think of, tokens. Uh, you know, the biggest problem that I see in the industry on tokens or these secrets is there is no one standard to generate tokens. AWS Cloud has their own way of AWS key. Azure has its own way. GCP has its own way. I mean, how can I know or how can any SaaS tool in the world know that there is an AWS credential in this code? A developer has checked in into his code. I mean, there is no one standard to create a token. Everybody can decide how they want to create a token. So SaaS tools are not able to detect your secrets. They, they die there. And the biggest uh, even problem is on the, on the uh, storage and accessing these secrets. People often, uh, I've seen a developer, for example, they, they, we told them, hey, you guys checked in an AWS credential into the source code. Please remove it. The guy removed the, uh, the code. And then he put a commit. In the commit message, you have an option to put a message. I removed the AWS key and he put the key name in the, in the commit message. I mean, after again six months, I was reviewing the source uh, source control system, the commit history, the AWS keys were there in the commit history. So developers often lack these problems that we tell them to fix certain things, but they introduce another bug again behind the scenes. So again, so source uh, control and the source control systems they are uh, often a big challenge. Some of the tools that we have personally investigated and we thought they are better for using for anybody. Most of these are open source. Uh, of course, there's a bit of trade with Sangre. Trufflehawk is a great one. GG Shield from uh, from then QB Scan, Detect Secrets, AWS Secrets, uh, Secret Scanner. A lot of these tools will apply to different scenarios. Some of them apply to your source code. Some of them apply to your source control system. Some of them to the orchestration. Some of them in the cloud. 
So various scenarios they apply. It's not for the same reason. So I, I, probably you will end up using all of these for various scenarios. And then uh, you have the uh, yeah. Please use. I always say this. Please use commercial tools because in supply chain right now the phase we are in, the open source tools are not supporting this. And you need to establish a vetting process. And I, I wanted to do a little bit deep topic on vetting process, but right now there's no time. A vetting process will tell a proper process in a company how a developer can choose a component to go with. Can, do we have an option to develop inside? Do we have an option to download from internet? Do we have an option to outsource it to some company? So various options exist for every developer when they want a component. So when they want a logging library, encryption library, or whatever reason they want, uh, there is there's a vetting process to go through. And this vetting process should also talk about the malicious components, how to handle that. Okay. Um, and then digitally sign. Uh, please sign every artifact, every code, the source code to be signed, the artifacts to be signed. Artifacts are any file that you output from your CICD build systems, like jar files, DLLs, EXEs, RPMs, whatever packages, if containers, star.zz, whatever you can think of, you can sign it with an authentic PKI. You can have an internal PKI and external PKI as well. The certificate authorities to sign them. And then uh, security education, nothing beats developer education, right? Secure coding practices to your dev guys. Make sure everybody is informed on uh, on these kind of things, the supply chain risks and what exactly we spoke about. This is what I say. A little bit word if we have uh, still time pending, good. Uh, on artificial intelligence, I'm, I'm two years experienced on AI, not much, but I will tell you one thing, I, I did some models and I see the bigger problem is in AI, which is the current topic in the market. AI. The way it works is the Google's TensorFlow, the most popular framework for AI. Everybody uses Keras or TensorFlow. Keras is now part of TensorFlow. The Google's TensorFlow is an open source framework which most ML developers, machine learning developers use, and the data sets. So we have a lot of image, uh, numerical, or language, speech, audio data sets. People just download them and use it. And these data sets or the frameworks or the pre trained models. Sometimes I take a model and I, 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 sorry, I take a data set and then I develop a model. Or I can just take a pre-trained model from the internet, like GPT. We all know chat GPT, but GPT itself is an op open source one, right? You can take GPT, you can host it on your PC, then you have a local chat GPT. You don't have to use the web application or the chat GPT as well. It's an open source. But GPT engine is an open source. <coughs> Hugging Face, very popular one for downloading many models uh, of the pre-trained models. None of these, we know if there is any malicious code. We have absolutely no way to know that there is a malicious code in that because technology has not evolved so fast for the security point of view to check if there is a malicious code, malicious code in this. But there are examples of uh, those uh, those um, pre-trained models to be malicious. We have seen that, but we don't know how to identify all those things. That's why so many patents and uh, being filed in this. So this is an area of discovery. Even the ECE school, for example, if you're interested, this is something you need to dig a lot. How to detect if any pre-trained model, including GPT or anything on GitHub, if I download a pre-trained model as pickle files, H5 files, you know, these are compiled models. So I create a model, I compile them as pickle, dot pkl, dot h5. How can I check whether this contains any form of hidden malware or hidden uh, malicious code? I don't know. Right now, there's no solution. But SEA tools, the component tools like Black Duck, and Python safety, you know, most of the machine learning is done in Python on R language. We know that. And Python safety is a third party open source tool. They work pretty well on finding the vulnerable components. Like if you're using TensorFlow 1.17, right now in 2.0, I don't know if there's any vulnerability, but the old versions have vulnerabilities reported. You can use these tools and they are able to tell you a little bit on the AI, but they are not so mature enough to find any malicious part on the AI stuff. Okay. Even the OS top 10 machine learning security risks is also pointing that one of the risks is a corrupted packages and that not just about vulnerability but also malicious part there is an OS top 10 machine learning security risks we want to refer that everything is a hyperlink there by the way and on a closing note i want to highlight that most CISOs i see you know, the chief information security officer of many companies they say hey i want to implement zero trust policy and if you go and look at your developer there's a zero <laughs> there is a blind trust policy this is download source from every everything that they want because they are not familiar that they are not supposed to download certain components from anybody. There's a research done by the University of Bonn in Germany, which I liked it. Uh, they say that if there is a malicious component that your company is using, 
on an average in the world it's taking 200 days to detect that you are taking a malicious component you are already using a malicious component probably they opened up a c2 channel command and control to a hacker with a port and they are sending the data exfiltration for over 6 months already over 200 days but the mean time to recover to fix we have no idea because it depends on various contexts but they say that it's taking 200 days for us for a company to detect that we are using malicious components already probably we are already using malicious components in our company and even attackers are growing smart uh, on the supply chain okay it's not just about simple they are trying to obfuscate the malicious code on the third party so it's not straight forward to see that there is a malicious code as well they are doing scanner based you code if you use mcafee or uh, any other clam av tools they are like not discovering that there is a malicious code in it they are looking for that and uh, they are even setting up custom exfiltration infrastructure that means they they don't directly make a c2 connection to the attacker they are going through various channels of one pc to another pc to another pc which is finally going through dmz to the external connection the thing is most often assume that hey this is an internal pc it's not connected to the internet is okay but they make another connection to another internal another internal which will often find a way out so custom exfiltration infrastructure is being possible as here and they are even hiding payloads in readme files last time i downloaded a readme and i pushed to scanner i saw that there is a trojan behind that as well so hiding payloads so don't blindly open even the readme files because that's the file often we open up first time interesting videos to watch if you are interested in further topic the one to bother you about so just on the closing part what you need to do next uh, if this is this why i often tell people if you have never implemented supply chain i know some of you are already doing this stuff but if you never understand the risks everything is risk driven right so understand the risks then educate your developers and apply the framework so these are the three step approach i recommend if somebody is interested in supply chain okay that's it Yes, a uh, big JSON document. Most, uh, thank you. It's a good question. Most often, uh, when you deliver a software and you deliver a signed as bomb, it is the responsibility of the consumer to look at the CV information present in it. So, if I told you the nutrition information on a toothpaste or a chocolate, you have to read that, right? It's your responsibility to read and understand the risk of what you're taking it. So when we sign it and give this file that contains not just the component but also the vulnerability information, it says I'm using Log4j and it has CVSS10 in it. So if the customer is seeing that and then signing it and then using it, then it's fine. But at least it, it, they are supposed to understand the CV inside there. The second thing is they can upload this uh, as uh, JSON files into their SCA tools like Black Duck or Sonata Type Nexus Lifecycle or OWASP Dependency Track. They can upload the SBO file. Which will continue to monitor for any new CV on the third party used. So if I know that uh, this is a third party library is used in my software, they can continue to monitor for any new CV on their side, which helps them to know that uh, there is a new zero day on this component, zero day vulnerability. So then I need to tell my producer to update the component. So they can monitor, they can look at the risks, and then decide. Does it answer? Interesting. Oh, you have a question? Just to continue on the yes, bomb part. Yes. Uh, uh, it seems to be quite a declarative uh, way to, uh, to express what is, let's say, in your software. Mm -hmm. So it, it seems to me that you have to, to, to place your trust elsewhere. So mm -hmm. in the tools that uh, are up to uh, collect and provide and, mm -hmm. and describe. To provide system. this as well. Right? So yes. if, if you have a malicious uh, software um, the, the developer, uh, why uh, don't you uh, put uh, everything that uh, should be? Appear that's why it's CI/CD. Okay. So when you move into the automation part and your uh, build platform generates the SBOM, it's not humans. It's not us manually generating the SBOM. It's your build platform that decides to generate the SBOM and signed on the pipeline, and it should be delivered into the cluster. So it's not there's no human involved in the generation of this. It doesn't happen. Okay. 
I have another question. Uh, you mentioned an, yeah. <laughs> okay. you mentioned an important part about uh, identifying malicious code, mm -hmm. malicious version of uh, an open source code product. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you see any international way of sharing this information, threat, threat intelligence network? Or? No. Right now, you, you must rely on uh, specific actors. Uh, yes, these third party big companies like Black Duck and Synopsys, they are the two leaders in this market right now. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, and Contrast is coming up, but nobody is doing as good as Syn uh, Synopsys, Black Duck, and Sonotype for the malicious part. Google is, like I said, is just coming up, but they promoted it only for GCP. But there's no other standards. I mean, frankly speaking, if you go deep inside, having a standard is not easy for malicious company. Yeah. It's not easy. So something to be debated by many experts in the industry to find some standard for this. Okay, thank you guys. I hope yeah, I guess. Ah, sorry. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I have one more question. Um, so if you have these CDs um, and let's say for uh, some open source library uh, version, I don't know, 1.2.3, um, do they take into account as well, for example, with which C compiler this thing was uh, built and um, which hardware the artifact was built when it gets no, Not in the standard of Cyclone DX that I remember, they don't talk about that. They just talk about the name, the author, the version, the CVE, the basic metadata information of the component. Right. Because but they don't deep work into it. Could still have an exploit if, uh, if the compiler which was used to, to generate. Possible, you can make a recommendation to Cyclone DX standard. Yeah, <laughs> possible. Right. Thank you guys. Thanks.